welcome everyone to LadiesCon 2021. We're so glad you could all join us. I'm here with guest Veronica Fish, an artist based right here in our own home state of Massachusetts. Veronica is known for her work with Marvel, Archie Comics, Dark Horse Comics, Boom Studios, IDW, and Image. She's also done character design for animation, illustration for print, and paintings for galleries. Welcome, Veronica. Hi, thanks for having me. We're so happy to have you here tonight. Oh, thanks. Um, we're really here to talk about um, your journey as an artist and um, your career to date. I know it's still early days, um, but um, if you could talk about your first days as an artist and, and really when did you start to draw? When did you know that this was uh, a career that you wanted to pursue? Sure. Um, so the first artist I ever saw working was my grandfather and my grandfather uh, painted, he loved Bob Ross and um, I think he spent most of his life in a factory. So he would come home. And in the basement, he would set up his, like, official Bob Ross. Like, he had this, this set of, like, the basic, like, four colors. And um, and I would just go downstairs to, like, through this, like, <laughs> like all of this, like, cigarette smoke. And it would start, <laughs> and, like, he would be there painting a, a sunset on an easel. And, like, he was a real super quiet guy. Um, but we would just, like, bond over painting and it was really fun. Like he would, he would light up a, a cigarette, he would pour a glass of wine and he would push the Dick Blick catalog toward me and he would go like, pick something out. <laughs> <laughs> it was so, it was sweet. It was really sweet. So he and I bonded over that and um, I started taking classes at an art museum. So I would take like, you know, drawing and painting. Um, and I got really into it, but I didn't think of it as a career. And then when I started working at the Worcester Art Museum, I actually met my future husband, and he was the one who said, um, "You know, you should, you should check out the comic book store that's in town. That's in, that's entertainment, which is in Worcester." Yeah. And I was like, yeah, "All right." So I went, um, and I just got really excited. Like I started looking at um, comics that I, I mean, I felt were underground. I don't know if they really are. Like I don't know if Will Eisner is like an underground artist. But um, he, he was to me because all the art that I was exposed to was like animation. So I would think of a, of a comic book as an animated show that I had seen, like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles or, or X Men. So I, I came into comics more through animation than the book. Um, but yeah, I just got excited. I started buying comics. Like um, I bought Mad Men. I love Mike Allred's work. Mm. Um, oh, actually, it's a little hard because it's like when someone says, you know, what, what comics did you start? It's like, there's kind of a lot, so it's hard to, it's like you're, you get brain freeze, but, um, so yeah, I started reading and I started doing more illustrations that were like storytelling. Um, and then it was my husband who said, you should think about school of visual arts because they like, they'll, they'll, they'll teach you how to do that in a professional way. Mm. They take it seriously. And um, because like, to me, a serious artist was a painter. Like I didn't, I didn't have any concept of what art as a job was or like what it looked like. I just knew from my grandfather's painting, like, oh, that's what artists do. They go in a basement <laughs> and they have wine and cigarettes <laughs> and they paint landscapes. Um, so I went to School of Visual Arts and I took so many great classes. Um, but I didn't take any any classes with any big comic book artists like Dave Mazzucchelli or Walt Simonson because I didn't, I don't know, I was dumb. Like I didn't get it. <laughs> so I got excited to do everything. So I would take like silk screen and, and etching and lino cut and, and like, you know, um, illustrative. Um, one of my, one of my teachers was, um, was an abstract artist. So he would like pour paint over the side of a, a balcony. So I was so into art in so many different ways. I didn't really think about comic books, I guess, till a little bit later. Um, but yeah, so I, just, I just made stuff all the time. And I was lucky that my parents let me move to New York. Um, and I spent all my savings. I worked at Sears, worked in the men's de department at Sears for like five years. <laughs> I spent all my money on tuition, like instantly. Like I remember going to the bank and like, I was all proud of myself. And like the number went to like $50 and I was like, whoa. <laughs> 
this sucks. <laughs> But I worked um, I worked at a daycare when I was living in New York to to supplement and then um, yeah and then I actually left after two two years so I didn't graduate from SBA because I couldn't afford it and then I moved to Boston and I finished my degree at, at Mass Art because um, when you're born in Massachusetts you get a tuition discount um, but I don't I don't regret that that decision it was it was fine I mean I met so many wonderful people in, in, in Boston. It's not like, um, it's not like New York was, was better. It was just, it was just bigger and more expensive and had more cockroaches. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I graduated in 2006 and I've just been uh, working since then. Do you feel like that grounding in um, other art forms has been a useful influence in the work that you do as a sequential artist? Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that was actually one of the, 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 the benefits to kind of going all in and like spending all your money on, on two, two years of, of that because you get access to equipment that you don't have in your house. Like you can use a giant press. You know, I, I can't find that here. Um, you can you you can use acid in your etchings. Like I can't just buy acid and set up something in my house. Like I wouldn't even know where to begin. Um, yeah, and then you just meet so many interesting people who are, who are into different things. Like, and they they teach you stuff. Um, they they teach you like about you know uh, photography and and how films develop. So you get like so inspired by other people's. Um, enthusiasm that yeah it, it definitely it definitely helps your work because you're like oh I can just go to a movie and I can stare at it for three hours and be like I'm gonna do that shot I'm gonna use that shot um you can go through photo book after photo book and be like I'm gonna draw that I'm gonna draw that so um so yeah I think it was really helpful for sure right because one of the things that I think is so important about comics as a medium is the way that words and pictures work together, right? I mean, that seems obvious, but I, I don't think people always realize that the art is there to move the story along in ways that aren't just literally saying what the words are saying, right? There's this opportunity to put in more. Um, and I, I guess my question for you is, do you, do you find that to be true? And, and how do you... Um, use that how do you use really visual storytelling in your work yeah um i can't remember who told me this but it stuck with me so deeply it was like for for comic books you the words should be saying something that you're not seeing in the image and the image should be showing the reader something that isn't spoken and that's so great that's such a cool i think really uniquely comic book thing that um, you can you can think in terms of how does this character talk? How do they sound? And yet, like in a thematic, cinematic way, how can I sh how 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 can I give the the reader clues to something else, like something bigger? Um, so yeah, I definitely think that's that's the that's the the fun of it. It's like being being this director. So mm -hmm. even, if, even if you're drawing someone else's script and technically they're the, you know, they're also a kind of director too. Um, yeah. That's, that's so much fun to, to be able to be like, Oh, I know I'm going to put something in the, in the background here. That's going to be really subtle. And the people who will notice it, it'll add a new dimension and the people miss it. They, they miss it and that's fine. Um, but yeah, it's fun to be able to, look at other artists and be inspired by like, oh, this is how they use that visual language. Like, I want to do that, that too. So, yeah. Right. There, and there's so many layers because then you get into colors and inks and it all matters. Mm. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit about your first uh, paid job as a professional artist um, and, and your path to getting there. And is there anything that you wish you knew at the time or, or anything that you do differently now than you did that first time? Well, it's certainly a balancing act. I remember um, getting excited to 
to sell a painting for the first time. And I remember um, pricing it really high. I think I had priced it at like $700. And it was like right out of our school. And someone wanted, wanted to buy it and they asked if, I, if they could lower, lower the price. And I was like, nope, no, 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 you can't. And now I regret it because that painting is still in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> it just said, yeah, sure, fine. Like, you don't, you, you shouldn't do that all the time. But I think when, you, when you're first starting out, it's good to have um, an unemotional attachment to your, to your work. I think it's important to not think of the first batch of art you do right out of, well, I don't know, art school, but like the first batch of art you do, I think don't get too um, emotionally involved with it because you're going to do so many more things. So it's, it's all right to let it go. Um, and I think when you hear stories about artists who like, oh, I wish I never sold that. Yeah, but um, at, the, at the same time, you should have the mindset like, well, I, I can do it again. Like I, I can make the, the next one better. So I think not being emotionally attached to your, to your work is, is, is important. Um, I do remember taking a job that, um, yeah, the, the, it was, <laughs> it was, um, I don't want to say the the person's name, but it was a it was a guide to to marriage, but the the author had revealed in the book jacket that he was not married and had never been married. The <laughs> was really, I don't think it was very good. <laughs> I'm sorry. And I remember having to illustrate all these crash test dummies getting into horrible accidents, <laughs> like on the oh road, right? and it was so odd and. Um, I remember taking, it was a pretty low, low pay rate. And I did many, many illustrations for this, for this project. Um, but everything that you do, that you get paid for it, you should think about is I'm getting paid to get better, like to practice. Mm. So maybe that helps. Um, right. So that, and, but also trying to think about how do you not completely undervalue your work, right? right? The, yeah, so absolutely. It's a, it's a total balancing act. And I think you, to some extent deal with that forever you know you just it just keeps happening in a way and so how did you make the transition into doing um, comic work professionally what was that transition for you i was doing illustrations for a whole bunch of things like um i did magazines like did some stuff for wired magazine i did some um i did the mascot for the worcester art museum helmet the dog and i think um I had work, so I, I was working on this project for myself. I was I, I did this Frankenstein project, and I wanted to do it all hand drawn, no digital. And I had worked on page after page after page. I think it had like 106 pages, and it was just this personal thing. And one one year, Andy and I, it's my husband, we were at Heroes Con in, in North North Carolina, and I had all my pages out in a giant 11 by 17 port portfolio, and I just put it out with really no expectation and I met Evan Dorkin and I met Chip Zdarsky and a couple of reps from um, DC and they were really drawn to these, these pages. Um, so then a few months later I got an email and said, hi from Archie comics. And I, my, my first thought, I, I almost, I almost deleted it because I was like, Oh, like I joined a mailing list and <laughs> I guess I, <laughs> I signed up for this. I don't remember doing that. Um, but it was Alex Segura, who's, um, he's moved on now, but he was the, uh, one of the big editors for Archie. And he said, I got your name from Chip and he recommended you. Um, so could you do a couple of sketches for us to kind of like try out for this Jughead mm -hmm. thing? And I, I was like, oh yeah, for sure. And I, I, so I did this, uh, drawing of Jughead, like reading Chaucer and he's like smoking a bubble pipe. It was so silly. And they said, that's great, but can you do more? Like, can you do Archie and Veronica? And I thought, oh, yeah, okay, because I, I, didn't, I didn't understand what they were asking. So um, then they had offered me um, Archie to take over after Annie Wu. Um, she did a, a jump issue after Fiona Staples did the um, remodel. Mm -hmm. And I, like, I really couldn't believe it, and I was absolutely terrified. And I remember I was – so freaked out at the idea of going after these two women that I tried my absolute hardest to draw like them, like to draw like mm. them and to draw like Annie Wu, that 
I was like studying their work and I tried to like match the brushes. And I think I can use the excuse that I wanted the reader to not have a jarring um, experience when they're reading the book. And then like, it's like different artists, different artists, different artists. So I wanted the transition to be as smooth as I could make it. But at the same time, I was just really, really scared at the thought of people reading my work. Um, and then at the thought of people like, you know, grading it with stars and like writing and being like, you know, the first three were good. And like the fourth one was, was good. But then the fifth one was really weird. <laughs> I don't know where it's going. So I was so, I was so worried about doing a good job that um, I think I didn't, well, maybe that's everybody. Maybe that's like, maybe that's just a typical creative thing that um, you're so, you're so worried about people liking it that, you try and think, what would they like instead of what do I do well? Mm -hmm. uh, but I think they turned out fine. And um, that was my first big gig was working for, work, working for our, um, Archie Comics in 2016. And then from that, I started working for Boom. Um, and then at the same time that Boom had asked me if I wanted to develop Slam, um, Marvel had emailed me and said, do you want to take over from uh, Javier? and do spider woman and because those emails came out at this at the same time and i was like there's no way i can say no to either of these things <laughs> i <laughs> took both those books at the same time and that was probably the most stressful year of my life because i was i had 44 pages due every month which meant that i was penciling and inking three pages monday through friday every day um so I, like i would get up in the in the, in the morning and I was like, I don't have time to hand draw this. I got to Cintiq all of these babies. <laughs> so I, I would draw from like eight, eight in the morning until midnight. And I remember going up to my, to my husband's studio and I was like, I can't do this. These pages look terrible. <laughs> I don't know what's happening. So he was great. He was like, if you need perspective and if you need like layout, I, you know, concepts, let me know. Um, so that's actually how he and I started working together was, um, Andy's done tons of cool stuff with Warner Brothers. He worked on Batman Beyond and Animaniacs. Mm. So he's really good at like quickly laying out for animation purposes, like, you know, here's the here's the shot, try that. Um and that really that really helped a lot. So um now I don't I I won't do two books at the same time if that ever happens again because it's just it's too much. <laughs> But, um, it's a lot. It's a, so, so yeah. So you've continued to work with your husband, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So when I had the opportunity to work on Sabrina, the teenage witch and, um, and Blackwood for, for dark horse, we were able to do it in four months, like six months segments. We, we worked on Blackwood for six months and then Sabrina and then Blackwood and Sabrina. Um, and that was just really fun. Like he just, he knows, so many cool things and he's like we should look at Kolchak and we should watch X-Files and we should watch uh, Bewitched and it was just it was really fun being able to bounce I, um, I, I, uh, ideas <laughs> off of someone who got what I was going for so yeah it's really worked out that's good because that that can be challenging sometimes, right? Mixing oh, mixing yeah. those things, not to uh, not to go too far down the route of the man with his crash test dummy marriage book, <laughs> <laughs> okay. but um, but it, it it sounds like a it's a positive partnership and um, and that's nice to be able to share that with like you said I think that that depth of connection can really make a difference. Um, so you mentioned starting when you know, when you started working with RG, trying to emulate the styles of uh, Fiona Staples and Annie Wu, who um, are, are these established folks. Um, once you sort of got into your groove, um, how do you put your own spin on these established properties, and particularly ones that have been around for such a long time? I think I recognize that um, I really like expressive Cart cartoony, um, a, that that kind of feeling with the with the characters, which probably stems from my love of animation. So once I realized that, like it's a, it's okay that 
I'm not so much of a painter that maybe I'm more of a cartoonist than an illustrator. Uh, I started to like allow myself to bring that out in the characters that they emote wildly. Um, so then when I was working on different properties, I thought, what is this character like? Like, what are they, how do they react when they're like, not just angry, happy, sad, but um, exasperated and dreamy, like kind of more nuanced things. So um, I watched some of the 90s, I love the 90s Sailor Moon, because I think she has such great like moments for like heart eyes and all kinds of fun stuff. Um, so I kind of let the influences that I like naturally um, influence the comic book work instead of worrying like, are, are people gonna like this? Um, and then I, you know, things just kind of began to click a little bit better. So I think for, for, for Sabrina, I really wanted readers to like her. I wanted them to like her as a teenager that was fun because I grew up with the Melissa Joan Hart version. And even though um, I think chaos is really cool, I, we weren't doing chilling ev uh, adventures, like right. chill, uh, chilling adventures of, of Sabrina, like Robert Hack got that and that has that kind of like moody darkness so when we had the opportunity to do this version we thought let's let's do something that the show doesn't um let's go in a different direction you know so it was fun to be able to do like um maybe she can see musical notes you know something that you can do in comics that you can't do in tv yeah um so we started to like really just try and make sabrina and a, a really well well-rounded person that she's nervous about these powers and she's also a really fun person and she's also really uh really strong and not afraid of anything and at the same time afraid of um typical things that teenagers are afraid of like trying to both fit in and also stand out it's a weird it's a weird time um but yeah so i think i think loving like go, going back to the to the stuff that got you into comics like 20 years later um i think it kind of made the work a little bit better personally yeah well because you're invested right you care about this character and, and building them out as a person i think is yeah. a really interesting way of approaching that um what's one of your favorite projects that you've worked on um Actually, I have the book. Um, so we, our creator-owned book that we did with Dark Horse is Blackwood. And this was really fun. When I was working at That's Enter Enter Entertainment when I was 16, I got to meet Evan Dork and I had him sign like my milk and cheese book. <laughs> so it's kind of cool that, I don't know, like 11 years later, we got to develop a, a book together. Yeah. Um, so this is really, this is really fun. I'm, this is a project that the issues had come out right as, as COVID hit. So right as the comic book stores were getting closed for a little while, and then the uh, production schedule had gotten canceled for like I think six months. Yes. Um, unfortunately, like three of those four issues came out. So we were going to promote it at um, Rose City Comic Con. We had badges made and banners, um, and that was that was put on hold. And I think the way that like publishing works is now that since this is a year old, it's like technically old news. Mm -hmm. um, so. If anyone is interested in, I don't know, I guess like 80s teen horror, like Return of the Living Dead, that's kind of this feel. It's like Sabrina, but much gorier. There's <laughs> <laughs> a lot of crazy stuff in here. Um, if you're into like X-Files, it's kind of like X-Files go to, go to college, that, that book. That actually sounds incredibly interesting to me personally. Oh, cool. Um, awesome. So there you go. I, I think that sounds great. Cool. Um, yeah, did you find that the pandemic had any other effects on your work? I know, yeah, um, as somebody who is closely affiliated with folks in a comic shop, it was a weird year and a half. Um, and, you know, and, and Ladies Con, we did entirely online last year. This year, we're hoping to do a hybrid. But of course, it feels like everything's always up in the air. You know, did it did it take a toll for you all? Yeah, I think. I think as as people who are naturally not antisocial, but you know, other than like meeting friends for dinner um, and like going to church, we don't really see people. You know what I mean? Like we don't have co coworkers. 
So when the, the real shutdowns happened and we couldn't see anybody, that was weird. And that started to really make me feel depressed. And um, like, you know, you, you try doing like video and calls and stuff, but without that human connection, it was really isolating. So for the first, for the first, first few months, um, I was like running around the house, like, um, like, like a hamster. I was like, what do I do? What do I do? <laughs> I got to get out of here. I got to do something. <laughs> I'm freaking out. And Andy's fine. He's like, he could be like a Franciscan monk. He's totally cool. He's like, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Like, we'll just see him later. <laughs> like, no, you don't understand. It's going to be different. They're going to, they're going to forget that we were ever friends. <laughs> no more dinner for me. Like it was weird, but, um, but yeah, I, I just started, I just started drawing in, in my, in my sketchbook, um, trying to work on more tra uh, traditional stuff because I have been doing digital for so long that I almost, I almost forgot what it was like to like have your hands all inky and you get, you know, <laughs> pencil down the side of your arm. Um, so yeah, it was, it was horrible. And then it kind of evened out and now it's okay. And I think now we're hopefully getting back to normal again. And then like, you don't want to lose that nice kind of, I already, I already said monk, but that kind of like monk like attitude of things are going to be all right in my little mountain hideaway. <laughs> It'll be all will be well. Mm. <laughs> all right. Um, do you have any advice for folks who are starting out yeah. in comics or exploring this as a career? Is there anything that you would say to any folks who are interested in uh, following in your footsteps? <laughs> Um, the best thing you can do is work all the time because your style will kind of like, um, I guess kind of like when you take a Polaroid picture and it begins to develop and like, you can't really see anything initially and like the light hits it. That's what your style will kind of do. Um, that you have your influences that guide you, but at the same time, your style will kind of naturally develop but it'll only do that from just constant working. So if you start to develop a fear of working, like, well, I'm afraid to draw like this because other people do it better. Um, you have to like, you, you just have to push through that and be like, Forget, no, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if other people figured this out first and they're really, really masters of it. That's okay. I'm going to try it anyway. Um, and just through sheer hours you eventually hit a point where somebody thinks you can do this. Hmm. And somebody sees something in your work that they feel would, you know, benefit the company or, or, or whatever, and they'll give you a shot. And then when you get that shot, you have to be punctual and you have to be pleasant to work with. Um, and then your, your, rep, your reputation of being on time and easy to work with will get you work with other people. Um, because editors kind of, you know, they'll sometimes shift. And editors are always thinking about who will make this deadline. <laughs> and then they think um, whose art matches this story. Amazing. So just simply by putting tons and tons of hours in, you'll get your level up. And then by um, being as professional as you can be, will keep you getting work. Um, I, I don't believe at all that this business is like, oh, it's, it's who you know, and like you got to be friends with, you don't. Um, you absolutely don't. Everyone is simply looking for who will make this book the best that it can be and who will get it in on time and we send it off to press. Um, so you can, you can absolutely do it. It's not, um, I think that's what's so, so great about comics. I think it's really accessible. And the more hours that you clock in, like you just, you just get by, by uh, steps, you get a little bit better, a little bit better. And maybe you don't see it. Maybe you think, I don't know, I'm definitely getting worse. This is really bad. <laughs> this really sucks. You're not. Like if you look at the work you did four years ago and you look at the work you do today, you, you are absolutely better in ways you can't really perceive. Um, so just by, just by simply not giving up, 
Um, I know it's kind of like a like a Saturday morning special, like a moral after the cartoon, but it's just it's just true. Um, so if you want to do this, you absolutely can. It's a uh, it's a it's it's a it's a fun life. I like my life. You, yeah, I get up at eight. I start working at like nine thirty. Uh, I work through until like maybe eight o'clock. Um, it's a it's a fun life. I think the 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 toughest thing for any creative person is just those kind of inner thoughts. That's like, should I do this? Does this is this really bad? People hate this, don't they? They do. <laughs> and you gotta like just put it away and say, forget it. I'm just gonna work. I'm just gonna work and make this make this art now. Um, so yeah, you can do it. I promise. Well, and I would imagine that the hardest thing is that there are, you know, in the age of the internet, you get to hear people's opinion of your work for free, Yeah, <laughs> whether, whether you want to do or not. I'm so glad that I didn't go to high school when like everybody had the internet. Oh my God. I don't know. I just, I, I, I saw today a baby holding a, a phone. Like, oh no. Oh. And I was like, oh no. <laughs> I mean, it's probably like looking at like a, a, a cartoon cat or something, you know, he's not, he's not reading crit like critiques, but um, yeah, you just, you just have to ignore, you, you have to ignore reviews from people that you don't trust. Yeah. And then you look for critiques from people that you really, you really think that they have your best interest and they understand that their that their critique is going to help you really get get better. Um, so by having a good relationship with someone who acts as your editor, your work will will improve and you'll stay you'll stay sane. So, yeah. <laughs> well, awesome. Well, I really appreciate your time. I think we'll we'll end on one question since you mentioned the '90s Sailor Moon cartoon. <laughs> uh, which of the Sailor Scouts uh, is either your favorite or that you most identify with? Oh, I love that. That's so great. Oh boy, um, my absolute favorite is Sailor Saturn because she's so super powerful, and I even named my external hard drive Saturn. And there's like a picture. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I have, I have a painting that a friend did. I love her, but as for personality, I really like Jupiter and I really like Venus. I think Venus is super fun. Um, but I think if we had to be honest, I think I'm I think I'm more like Jupiter because I got in trouble for punching someone when I was <laughs> in school. Oh wow. <laughs> this fight in the hallway. It's the only time I've ever been in in, in a fight ever. Um, but yeah. <laughs> well, that, what, what a note to end on. <laughs> oh, no, oh, no. I'm not violent, I <laughs> No, I, I love that. I think that, uh, you know, what you know yourself by, by which Sailor Scout you, you must I, identify with. I wish I was Sailor Saturn because she's so, like, she's so cool and collected. But yeah, that was a good <sighs> show. Everybody plays their part. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we really appreciate it. And I hope everyone enjoys the rest of Ladies Con and have a great night. Thanks so much. I appreciate it.